I recently purchased a hot new title at UK Games Expo. After Us illustrates a world where humans are now extinct and apes are thriving. Each player starts with a selection of tamarins in their deck, and by combining tamarin cards, players generate resources which they can utilise to gather more powerful cards – chimpanzees, gorillas and orangutans. And as their decks grow, players' turns are more and more productive, eventually generating victory points. When one player achieves the victory point target, they win the game. After Us is a beautifully illustrated, intriguing new deck building game. And it's not the first. Not by a long shot. In fact, there are currently over 4,000 such games listed on the BoardGameGeek database, and the genre didn't even exist before 2007. In this video, I'm going to explore the enduring popularity of the deck building genre, and unpick the design decisions made by innovators in this space. I'm Adam Porter, I'm a game designer from Wales, and on this channel I like to dip into specific genres and try to pinpoint the core elements frequently used in these games. If you like what I do, please subscribe, comment and share the video. Are there any aspects of gaming which you just love, even though they aren't strictly speaking part of the gameplay itself? I briefly dabbled with role-playing games in my early teenage years, and I distinctly remember that the most fun part was generating a character, an exercise which took place before the game began. Now, I clearly wasn't alone in this. Keith Mateka took character generation as the inspiration for his 2016 dice-drafting game, Role Player. That same year, Brad Talton's Millennium Blades was released, a game simulating all the excitement of acquiring, trading and competing in collectible card games. Sometimes the stuff we do around a game is engaging enough that it could become a game. Prior to 2007, deck construction was always a solitary pre-game activity, putting together your own personal deck of cards to bring to a competitive game. But these days, deck building is frequently the main event. It's become one of the most dominant mechanisms in the world of hobby games. And if you're interested in how these games work, or even designing a deck building game of your own, well, this video's for you. And don't forget to go back and watch earlier videos in the series. I've made similar videos looking at tableau building, abstract strategy, worker placement, roll and writes, party games, and many more. This series is a toolbox for you as a game designer. What common mechanisms do you want to employ in your own deck building game? Which aspects could you subvert? And crucially, which mechanisms spring to mind which haven't yet been utilised? Is there space for innovation here? We ought to kick off by defining the mechanism. The Board Game Geek website is the central hub for gamers worldwide, so it's as close to an authority as we're going to get. So let's see what they have to say about it. Deck, bag and pool building. Players play cards out of individual decks, seeking to acquire new cards and to play through their decks iteratively, improving them over time through card acquisition or card elimination. So there are two defining features of a deck builder. Firstly, each player has their own deck of cards, and secondly, the cards within that deck change over time. But not so fast. There's an assumption even in that concise definition. Why does it have to be cards? What if we were tipping dice from a cup, or pulling cardboard chits or meeples from your own personal bag? I see no meaningful distinction between deck building and so-called bag building or pool building games. So all will be considered together in this overview. The deck building mechanism first emerged as one small element of an epic space combat board game, which was 2007's Starcraft from Corey Kineska and Christian Peterson at Fantasy Flight. But it was Donald X. Vaccarino's Dominion, released the following year, which truly created the genre, condensing the gameplay down to a single mechanism and providing a prototype for other designers to iterate on over subsequent years. Dominion created the formula that all other deck builders follow. In Dominion, each player starts the game with a tiny deck of 10 cards, 7 coins and 3 estate cards, which are each worth a point but do nothing helpful for you. At the start of your turn, you draw 5 cards from your deck, initially a mixture of coins and useless estates, and then you spend your coins to purchase a better card from the market. The spent coins and the newly purchased card are both placed into your discard pile. The cards in the market are called Kingdom cards, and there are always 10 of these to choose from plus a variety of better money cards – silver and gold – and higher point scoring cards – duchies and provinces. In each game, a different selection of cards is used, with a vast number of possible combinations. 
The selection in any given game is static. The same cards are available to all players and they never change. Clearly, after two turns, your deck will have run out. At this point, your discard pile is shuffled and that becomes your new deck. But now, those exciting powerful Kingdom cards have been incorporated into your deck, allowing you more and more options as the game progresses. The Kingdom cards might award you more coins to spend, or allow you to chain card effects, or purchase multiple cards from the market, or they might generate you victory points. As your deck improves throughout the game, you can afford to buy even more powerful cards, eventually culminating in purchasing the high-scoring provinces. When these have all gone, the game ends. At this point, each player will have a substantial deck of cards full of all sorts of exciting additions, but it's the victory points we care about, so we total these up and the highest scorer wins. Other game makers were quick to spot the enormous potential of Vaccarino's invention. New deck builders emerged just a few months after Dominion. Arctic Scavengers, Thunderstone and Tanto Kuori were among the first, all closely imitating Dominion's system. In this video, I'm going to discuss 10 features that you might want to consider if you're designing your own deck building game, and show you loads of great examples of the genre if you're simply here for the ride. But before we get stuck in, there's a brief message that I want to share with any designers watching. This video is sponsored by Launch Tabletop. Now I recently used their Launch Lab print-on-demand service to create my own flip and write game, and the results were incredible. Everything from the box, to the cards, to the pad of player sheets feels every bit as high quality as a professionally published game. Indeed, the quality is higher than many games that I've purchased for my collection. This is a prototype for pitching to publishers, but frankly I'm reluctant to let it go. I'm totally hooked on it. Fortunately, if you order more copies of your game, the prices drop, so I'll be picking up a few more copies of this one to share. If you fancy making your own professional quality game, visit launchtabletop.com and use the discount code ADAMINWALES for a 20% discount. Launch Lab ships games worldwide, and mine have always arrived about three weeks later, which is an incredible turnaround time. And now, back to the video. Dominion was a slick product. Gameplay was smooth and Vaccarino's choices were smart. There were no rough edges and everything seemed exactly as it should be. There was, however, one element of Dominion that the majority of subsequent deck builders quickly abandoned. The static marketplace. And that brings me to the first of my 10 considerations for designers of deck building games. Deck building games have a degree of randomness related to the frequent shuffling and drawing cards blindly from a deck. Now, Dominion mitigates the randomness somewhat by providing an unchanging pool of cards to purchase throughout the game. This gives players a roadmap. In Dominion, you can essentially plan your strategy as soon as the Kingdom cards are revealed, before you've even taken your first turn. There's relatively little player interaction in the game to disrupt your plans, so this makes for a very strategic game. But it's not a very dynamic system. You essentially pick your path in the early turns, and then you watch the game play out. One of the first innovations in the post-Dominion designs was the introduction of a dynamic system for the marketplace. 2010's Ascension distinguished itself from the early deck builders by providing a marketplace where the available cards change on every turn. When one card is purchased, the market slot is filled by drawing another card from the market deck. This system has a lot of advantages. It makes the game considerably easier to set up and pack away, it uses less table space, and it makes for an engaging, unpredictable experience. The downside of the dynamic marketplace is that it adds further randomness to an already pretty random system. Taverns of Tiefenthal uses a mixture of static options, so cards which are always available for consistency, and a constantly shifting selection of cards for variety. A similar mechanism is used in Clank and Mystic Veil and many other deck building games. Later designs have attempted to find a middle ground between the static market and the river system, with a variety of intriguing marketplaces. After Us is unusual in that the cards you purchase are drawn unseen from the top of a deck. You know roughly what you're going to get. Gorillas tend to increase the rage track. Mandrills frequently generate victory points. Orangutans tend to create energy. And chimpanzees copy abilities. But the specific card that you're purchasing is unknown. In Super Mother Load, each player has their own personal marketplace, which only they can access, forcing players to pursue divergent strategies. 
Your personal market contains four stacks of cards which are unique to you. Each stack is ordered such that the cards get more expensive as you purchase cards of that type. In Quest for El Dorado, each pile in the market has only three cards, and when the pile is emptied, the next player to access the market selects a new pile of three cards to introduce in its place. Clank introduces card abilities which activate when the card first enters the market, and others which have an immediate effect when a player purchases a card. Futst is a tiny early deck building game from Welsh designer Tony Boydell. In this game, cards are auctioned off to the players who make blind bids with their existing cards to buy upgrades for their deck. Despite these various innovations, neither the static marketplace of Dominion or the dynamic system from Ascension have become outdated or obsolete. 2018's Quacks of Quedlinburg uses a system very similar to Dominion's, with a variety of abilities selected during setup and remaining available to all players throughout the game. Of course, whichever system you use, card balance should be at the forefront of your mind when designing a deck building game. All cards don't need to be equally powerful, but their cost should reflect their power. Or perhaps powerful cards should come at a reduced cost, but carry a sting in their tail. They give you loads of great actions, but they sneak a less positive card into your deck when you use them, or they add a punishing token into your supply. Deck building is inherently a solitaire exercise. That is to say, the mechanism is not dependent on multiple players being present at the table. Friday by Freedom and Fries is an example of a game which is only playable by a solo player. Nonetheless, most deck building games are multiplayer experiences, so what purpose do the other players serve? Well, many deck builders are essentially a race. The other players set the pace and compete to purchase items from a depleting pool. In Dominion, the game ends when all high-scoring provinces have been taken. In Mystic Vale, the game ends when the pool of victory point tokens is empty. In After Us, the game ends when one player reaches 80 points on the score track. Dominion also features a little constructive interaction on some of its cards. When you use a certain card, other players also benefit. But the most common form of interaction in a deck builder is destructive. And this is fairly muted in Dominion. Certain card actions will gift curse cards to other players. And curses are wholly bad. They're worth negative points. They don't do anything. They just clog up your hand. But Dominion doesn't allow you to target specific players. If one opponent gains a curse, then all opponents do. Star Realms is more direct in its destructive play. In Star Realms, cards have the traditional two currencies, victory points and money, but there's a third currency, combat, which allows you to attack your opponent when you play such a card. Attacking an opponent reduces their victory points, here called authority, and when you reduce an opponent to zero authority, you win the game. Each player starts the game with eight scouts, which provide money, and two vipers, which provide combat. On your turn, you can spend money to purchase new cards from the market, which automatically refills. If an opponent has purchased a base, its abilities always remain in play until it's destroyed, and if it's an outpost, you must destroy the base before you can attack your opponent directly. The Star Wars deck building game uses a similar system, but the two players are highly asymmetric. The Rebel player can only use Rebel cards, and the Imperial player can only use Imperial cards. Certain card effects shift the balance of the force. Some card abilities only activate if the force is with you, meaning that the little white cube is in your half of the track. The aim of the game is to destroy three of your opponent's bases by attacking in a similar manner to Star Realms. But players can protect their bases by purchasing capital ships, which need to be destroyed before a base can be attacked. Additionally, in this game, players can attack cards in the market, provided they belong to the opposing faction. If you beat the target value, the card is discarded from the market, and you gain the reward indicated. Now, the concept of attacking cards in the market isn't new. In Clank, you can attack monsters in the display and gain rewards for your efforts. The unusual feature of the Star Wars deck building game is the ability to attack cards your opponent could otherwise have purchased for themselves. Of course, opportunities for interaction increase dramatically when your playing pieces occupy the same physical space, and one of the major early innovations in the deck building genre was utilising the core mechanism to power player actions and interactions on a shared board. 
Early examples include Martin Wallace's A Few Acres of Snow, which utilised deck building to power an area control war game. Hisashi Hayashi's Trains used the mechanism to power a network building board game. And Jeremy Lennart's For the Crown featured a bizarre mashup of Dominion and chess, with new chess pieces with more elaborate moves introduced to the board when purchased from the market. In 2015, Super Motherload featured players drilling for resources on the planet Mars, placing tunnels on the central board to reach the mineral tiles and bonuses beneath the surface. In 2019, Clank Legacy saw players move across a board to collect point-scoring artefacts and then race to return to the base. Of course, there are many monster encounters and fantastical events along the way. In the same year, Trevor Benjamin and David Thompson introduced their Undaunted system, featuring military squads in a small-scale skirmish, with all their actions – scouting, moving and shooting – powered by a core deck-building mechanism. It's become increasingly clear since the release of Dominion that deck-building is not a small niche of the card game genre, but a versatile mechanism in its own right, which can be utilised to power a vast range of different game engines. Essentially, deck building gifts players with a variety of disparate actions on each turn, and these could be literally anything. The system gives some control to players over the actions in their pool, but it randomises when specific actions will become available, and as such it offers more flexibility and control than the traditional roll and move mechanism as featured in Monopoly, or roll for resource production as in Catan, or even roll for combat as seen in any number of dungeon crawlers and thematic war games. But the uncertainty of the card draw, or the pull of tokens from a bag, retains the excitement of those well-worn mechanisms. Now I mentioned previously that card-only deck builders like Dominion or Mystic Veil vale frequently feature a race to achieve a victory point goal. Over recent years, several games have translated that system into a literal race across a board. In the quest for Eldorado, Rainer Knizia has the players racing across the South American jungle. Cards purchased from the display represent items which help players to traverse a variety of terrains. Heat is a Formula One racing game powered by in-game deck construction and deconstruction. Each player has their own deck of cards and a separate pool of heat cards. Your deck contains numbered cards which dictate how far you can move on your turn, and there are also wild cards which move you forward an unpredictable amount and you can boost, drawing an additional card by adding heat cards to your deck on each turn. Now, heat cards clog up your deck, limiting your choices because they don't have a movement value on them. On your turn, you draw seven cards from the deck and select your gear. The chosen gear determines how many cards you can play from your hand, and you can move up or down one gear on your turn, or two gears, by taking additional heat cards. When your chosen cards are revealed, you move a number of spaces equal to the total from your cards. This total represents your speed, but you need to take care, because each corner has a speed limit, and if you surpass it, you have to take heat. You can get rid of heat cards by moving into low gears, but of course, this slows you down. Now, heat is an unusual inclusion on this list in that it features no marketplace. You can't buy more powerful cards in-game. You simply need to manage your existing deck, and the balance of useless heat cards against the more useful movement cards. Now, the benefit of sharing a physical space is really highlighted in this game. Timing and position relative to other cars plays a huge role. Turn order starts with the cars at the front of the pack, but the cars at the back get a couple of advantages. They can move one extra space, they can discard a heat card, and if they end their move immediately behind or adjacent to another car, they can slipstream forward two spaces. So the game is all about deck management, preparing yourself for that final straight across the finish line, ensuring that you have enough heat left in your engine to boost your way to victory. The heat cards are a clever mechanism preventing runaway leaders. Sure, you can boost your way around the track, overtaking your opponents by collecting heat cards on every turn, but these cards are going to come back to haunt you, clogging up your hands, serving no purpose, and reducing your options on future turns. Take too many, and you might even spin out of the race. This sort of headwind is a staple in the deck building genre. The highest scoring cards are generally balanced such that they provide the weakest action, or no action at all. Hence, in Dominion, as you gather point scoring duchies and provinces, the likelihood is that your hand of cards on each turn is more and more clogged up with cards which just don't do anything. This slows your momentum and gives the other players a fighting chance of catching up. 
In the Undaunted games, these hand-clogging cards are thematically named Fog of War, and players take them as a penalty when they carry out certain actions. Unlike Dominion's Provinces or Clank Legacy's Mysterious Tomes, the Fog of War cards have no upside. No victory point bonus at the end of the game. So as with Heat cards in Days of Wonders Racing game, players attempt to rid their deck of Fog of War cards as they play. Now in most games, the more stuff you gather, the better you're doing. And that's not true of a deck building game. An effective deck will produce powerful card combinations on every turn. And that means you need to rid your deck of the less powerful cards to maximise your chances of drawing just the combo you need. This is counterintuitive to newcomers to the genre, because it will sometimes mean discarding cards in the mid game, which were really valuable in the early game. But it's a key strategy in most deck building games, and entire engines can be built around the ability to trash your cards, removing them from the game. After Us has a neat system for trashing cards, an ability which appears to be a core focus for the Grillers. When you play a Gorilla card, creating an appropriate action combination, you can advance on your own personal rage meter. And when you reach a certain point, you can spend rage to trash a card from your hand. And doing so generates the reward showing in the top corner. Abandon All Artichokes is a deck building game for young children and families. Players start the game with a deck entirely made up of artichokes. The goal is to trash your artichokes, and the winner of the game is the first player to draw a hand with no artichokes in it. Dale of Merchants is another game which features deck thinning as a central mechanism. In this game of animal merchants, you have the usual option of buying cards from a constantly shifting marketplace with card costs dependent on their position in the row. You can alternatively use your cards for their printed action, but you also have the option of placing sets of cards from your hand into a stall, essentially trashing them so they can't be used again in the game. The cards in the first set that you place in your stall must total a value of exactly one. The second set must feature cards of the same animal type, totalling exactly two. And the third set must have matching cards totalling three, and so on, until one player places their eighth set of matching animals into their stall, thus winning the game. Dale of Merchants is built around the concept of creating sets of cards of matching types. Super Motherload is another deck builder where creating sets of matching colour opens up the most powerful opportunities for the player. On your turn, you can discard any number of matching coloured drill cards to create a tunnel with a total length equal to the number of cards discarded. 2014's Paperback is a unique little product, a word building game in the mould of Scrabble or Bananagrams, with a deck building mechanism driving the letter draw. On your turn, you draw a selection of cards from your personal deck, each featuring a letter. And if you can combine the letters to form a word, which is essentially an elaborate set collection exercise, you generate currency, which can be spent to buy more valuable letters to add to your deck. Dominion features a single currency, coins, which can be used to purchase additional cards. Thunderstone was one of the first deck builders to really open this up, introducing multiple currencies. Like Dominion, Thunderstone uses coins, which can be spent to buy new cards from a static market, but it adds a tax, which accumulate, allowing you to defeat monsters in a dungeon. Each character can supplement their attacks using a weapon, but there's a third currency, Strength, which might allow you to utilise the weapon, or might stand in your way. A fourth currency, Light, dictates how far you can venture into the dungeon, the row of monster cards. And a fifth currency, Experience, is gained by defeating monsters, allowing you to upgrade your character cards. Many recent deck builders use multiple currencies. In Living Forest, the left side of each card has a series of icons, each of which powers a different action. So suns allow you to buy cards to add to your deck, saplings allow you to purchase tree tiles to add to your player board, and these give permanent symbols which are always present in every future turn. Wind allows you to move around a central board, giving you access to the action that you land on, and water puts out fires, which prevents players needing to fill their deck with useless, punishing fire demons. And the flower icon doesn't award you with any actions, but it counts towards one of the endgame goals of amassing 12 flowers in a single round. In After Us, most of the currencies are tokens generated by card play, and there are several of them. Flowers are required to purchase mandrills, fruits are used to buy orangutans, and grains will get you gorillas, with a mix of tokens allowing you to pick up chimpanzees. And energy tokens are used to access special abilities. 
And there's a fifth currency, rage, which is marked on a track, and then later spent to thin your deck. After Us is also notable for the manner in which these currencies are gathered. Players combine cards to create closed boxes, icons, which dictate which items are gathered or which resources can be traded for more powerful alternatives. The effect of using tokens and tracks to record currency, rather than limiting players to that showing in their hand at any given time, is that the currency accumulates over multiple rounds. You don't have to spend it immediately. And this changes the flow of the game substantially, allowing you to hold off on purchasing items on one turn in order to save for a bigger purchase later, something which isn't possible in most deck builders. Early Dominion sets didn't allow players to carry items over from one turn to the next. Each turn started with a fresh card draw and an entirely new set of options. Duration cards were introduced in the second Dominion expansion, Seaside. Now, duration cards are not discarded at the end of your turn like other cards. They remain in play until they've been activated, at which point they're discarded. Some deck builders do, however, allow you to hold on to as yet unactivated cards from one turn to the next. This is true of Heat, where you can choose freely how many of the cards you wish to retain in your hand and how many to discard. It's true of Super Motherload, where only your activated cards are discarded. And it's true of Dale of Merchants, where you have to spend an action if you want to discard any unused cards from your hand. Mystic Veil's Veil cards are another example of an enduring effect. When purchased, these cards are not added to your deck, but placed in front of you and present on every future turn. Most are passive, simply scoring victory points at the end of the game. But others do have effects which can be applied on every turn after the Veil card is purchased. In this way, the Veil cards function similarly to the trees gathered by players in Living Forest. Now there's no doubt that Living Forest was heavily influenced by mechanisms used previously in Mystic Veil, most notably in the Push Your Luck mechanism at its core. In most deck building games, you draw a consistent number of cards on every turn, sometimes adding additional cards through card effects. But in Living Forest and Mystic Veil, you can draw as many cards as you like, so long as you don't go bust. In Living Forest, you receive two actions per turn, for example, purchasing a card or moving on the central track. You go bust when you draw a third solitary creature into your hand. Now this has two effects. It prevents you from drawing more cards and it reduces you to a single action. Of course, there are cards you can purchase which counter the solitary creatures. Adding gregarious creatures to your deck allows you to draw more solitary creatures without going bust. Now this system was lifted directly from Mystic Veil, vale, which terms the solitary icons decay and the gregarious icons growth. Mystic Veil vale is somewhat more punishing. If you go bust, you don't get any action at all, though you are compensated by flipping your mana token, which gives you an additional currency to spend on a card purchase on a future turn. Quacks of Quedlinburg uses a similar system. Players pull tokens from their bag, placing them onto their own cauldron player board. They can pull as many tokens as they wish, but if they ever gather more than seven points worth of white cherry bomb tokens, they go bust, preventing them from drawing any more tokens. Just as in Living Forest, players are reduced from two actions to a single action. Where normally a player could take victory points according to their position on the track and purchase some new tokens for their bag, if you've gone bust, you can only do one of these things, your choice. With Mystic Veil vale and Quacks of Quedlinburg, we've started to illustrate various ways in which the designers have subverted not just the mechanisms, but also the form of deck building games. Quacks of Quedlinburg is a bag building game, a subgenre of the deck building family introduced by Puzzle Strike in 2010 and popularised by Quarriers and Orleans. In essence, a bag building game is near identical to a card based deck builder but the smaller components open up new angles to explore, such as placing tokens onto tracks and allowing for much larger hands. And you don't need to waste time endlessly shuffling cards. There is a subtle difference between card-based deck builders and bag builders though, in that the order of the components is not set, so actions can't directly manipulate the sequences of future reveals. You can't easily, for example, have a power which lets you look at the next four cards in your deck, then reorder them, or place them on the bottom of the deck. 
In Quacks of Quedlinburg, players attempt to progress as far as they can along their track on each turn by pulling tokens from the bag without going bust. One fantastic innovation in the physical form of this game is the fact that the tokens remain the same in every game but the powers of these tokens alter based on the tiles selected at the start of the game. Hence, every game plays differently without the vast number of cards required for a traditional deck builder. Crank's headline feature is that it combines deck building with an element of bag building. Certain cards in a player's deck generate clank cubes, thematically representing an adventurer making noises which might awaken the dragon. Whenever a dragon icon enters the market, the dragon attacks. All clamp cubes which players have generated are added to the dragon's bag and then mixed with the harmless black dragon cubes and then a number of tokens are drawn out of the bag equal to the dragon's current rage value. If a cube of your colour is drawn from the bag then you take a wound and taking too many wounds will end your game prematurely. Black dragon cubes are not returned to the bag after an attack, so throughout the game the danger cranks up as the dragon's rage escalates, increasing the number of cubes drawn, and the chances of drawing a cube of your own colour increases as the harmless black cubes decrease in number. 2011's Quarriers was the first to combine dice with the deck building mechanism. Players each have a bag filled with dice which are rolled, and the results determine which additional dice you can purchase and add to your bag. The system was later refined and reimagined as the collectible dice game Dice Masters. These dice pool building games are not seen as frequently as the traditional card based deck builder, but there have been a number of iterations over the years. In Tom Lehman's Cube, players each start the game with five identical white dice. On your turn, you roll your dice and you use the results to generate actions, swapping dice with new dice from the supply, re rolling dice, or adjusting dice to show a different face. Alternatively, you can place dice into your dice tray to form combinations which match the available spell cards. These are worth points at the end of the game. So throughout the game, players trade dice for new dice, upgrading their pool and forming combinations to claim victory points. Roll for the Galaxy is a more complex dice pool building game, again designed by Tom Lehman. Each round, all players simultaneously roll their entire pool of dice and then allocate each of them to the five possible phases. When all players' selections are revealed, all of the selected phases happen in order. In the explore phase, players can select tiles to put under construction, or simply take galactic credits. The develop and settle phases allow you to place dice onto tiles under construction, to eventually bring them along with their effects into your tableau. And when you bring a new world into your tableau, it will bring a new die with it. The produce phase allows you to place dice as goods onto planet tiles in your tableau, and the ship phase allows you to sell these goods for galactic credits or victory points. All used dice are placed into your citizenry, where they remain inactive until credits are spent at the end of your turn to recruit inactive dice back into your cup. Now Dice Forge goes a step further than Cube and Roll for the Galaxy, allowing players to remove the faces of an individual die and replace them with more powerful effects. A literal dice building game. Now this system was first explored in Stephen Glenn's forgotten 2014 title Rattlebones, and it was later revisited by Tom Lehman in 2022 with Dice Realms. In Dice Forge, each player has two dice and an inventory where they can keep track of resources, points and gold that they've gathered. On a player's turn, all players roll their dice simultaneously and add any resources, gold and points rolled to their inventories. The player whose turn it is now purchases cards from the display which cost resources but give special abilities and victory points. Or they can spend gold to purchase new faces for their dice. The dice are adjusted immediately by clicking off the existing faces and replacing them with new improved faces. And so the sequence repeats with players generating more and more resources on each turn until they can purchase the high point scoring cards which are likely to win them the game. But while the physical construction of Dice Forge feels fresh, the central mechanism isn't actually as new as it seems. Machi Koro introduced the concept of progressively upgrading dice faces back in 2012. This game used generic numbered dice, but the effect of each numbered face was determined by the cards in front of each player, so you could upgrade your tableau such that you generated fantastic rewards whenever a 6 was rolled, or a 2, or a 3, but the dice themselves were never physically altered. 
This is a similar concept to the unchanging tokens in quacks, with powers assigned to them by changeable tiles. Much cheaper solution, and considerably easier to prototype and manufacture. Perhaps this is why we've seen a fair number of dice builders in the Machi Koro mold, Space Base, uh, Dice City, My Farm Shop and Bellum Magica all being notable examples, but we've seen very few dice builders in the style of Dice Forge or Dice Realms. John D. Clare carved out a niche for himself with his card crafting system. These games feature transparent acetate sheets layered over the top of each other to create unique cards. It wasn't a wholly new concept. The card game Gloom had done something similar in 2005, but this was the first time acetate cards had been used in a deck building game. On your turn, you reveal cards contained within clear plastic sheets using a similar push your luck system to that seen in Living Forest. The main currency is mana, which can be spent to purchase acetate sheets to slip inside the sleeve layered over one of the cards in your hand. So in this manner, players can craft their own unique cards to use in later turns. John D. Clare used a similar system in his later games Dead Reckoning and Edge of Darkness. So, with over 4,000 games in the deck building genre, is there really any point in utilising this mechanism in your own designs? Is there anything new to discover? Well, frankly, I've no idea. I've played many deck builders, but I've still only scratched the surface of those which are available. There's a strong chance that if you create a brand new twist on the genre, someone else may well have already done something similar. But the chances of them having done it in exactly the same manner as you, with the same theme, in the same form, with the same focus and balance, are vanishingly small. Deck building is an incredibly versatile mechanism, and it doesn't need to be the core of your game system. It might just power one aspect of the game, balanced by other mechanisms, as we've seen recently in Lost Ruins of Arnak and Dune Imperium. So where are you going to start with your deck building design? Could you experiment with the form? We've seen bag building, dice pool building, dice and card drafting, and even a combination of the above in Clank. So what else could you throw in a bag and pull out again to create a fresh experience? Perhaps you'd like to start with a theme that interests you. Deck building is one of the most frequently used mechanisms when publishers want to put out a game based around a beloved property. Harry Potter, well there's a deck builder for that. Marvel, check. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, yep. Toy Story, Alien, Transformers, My Little Pony, deck building has it covered. There's just so much scope for characters, items, and locations from a pre-existing world. Frequently, pop culture deck builders are not the most mechanically innovative, but they attract a wide fan base regardless because of the references, the setting, and atmosphere. The likelihood is, as a freelance designer, you're not going to be able to access intellectual properties and brands from TV and film, but that shouldn't stop you taking inspiration from a setting that excites you, whether that's high fantasy, science fiction, scantily clad Japanese maids, or tournament fishing. Perhaps you're more interested in experimenting with mechanisms than you are with theme or components. In which case, I've highlighted many of the key design decision points in the genre in this video. How do players win? What's their goal? Is the game competitive like Dominion? Cooperative like Marvel Legendary or Eon's End? Or Solitaire like Friday? How do players accumulate cards in their hand? Do you always draw the same number or is that variable? How many can you play on your turn? Your entire hand or one at a time? Are you using a static marketplace or something a bit more dynamic? How can you create a unique, interesting marketplace, something which hasn't been done before? Look at Fust with its blind bidding, or Mystic Veil vale with its push your luck card draw. What other mechanisms do games use to get cards into players' hands? Could one of those become a deck builder? What happens when you purchase a card? Does it go on the discard pile for use later in the game? Or does it go on top of your deck, as in Living Forest and After Us, for immediate use in your next turn? What happens when a player's deck runs out? Is the discard pile shuffled, as in most games in the genre? Or could the cards remain in the order they were originally played, as in Eon's End? Are players able to trash cards, thinning their deck? And is this a viable winning strategy? How do players interact? Can they attack each other? Are these attacks targeted, or do they affect all players equally? Could you build some positive interaction into the game? How many currencies do you have in your game? Do players gather tokens which accumulate over multiple rounds? Or are they limited to the cards in hand at any given time? What carries forward from one round to the next? 
Can you make use of deck clogging cards to prevent runaway leaders, those useless provinces, heat cards and fogs of war? How do they find their way into players' decks and what effect do they have? How are you going to add variety between games? Variable setups, missions and goals are commonplace in this genre. One certainty is that designing a balanced deck builder is going to be a ton of work. The game will need testing a vast number of times to balance all the different variables and this might be more easily achieved using a digital program like Tabletop Simulator to prevent you needing to print and reprint hundreds of cards over and over again every time you adjust the card balance. Now I hope this has sparked some ideas for you, or given you some areas to reflect on if you're already in the process of designing your own deck builder. And if you're not a designer, I hope it's demonstrated some new titles which you haven't heard of, but you might want to give a try. If you enjoyed the video, you might like the video I made recently about worker placement games. So follow the link.